Good evening, certainly a pleasure to uh, be together again and to study from God's Word. As I mentioned this morning in our uh, Bible class in the book of Romans, we were focusing on chapter 13. We didn't really get the sufficient time that we were looking for to look at chapter 14, and that's fine. Uh, one of the goals uh, that that I think is always a positive goal is to have a cl Bible class that is productive, fruitful, engaging, and uplifting, and uh, people leave with uh, more knowledge and more interest than they came. And that's the objective. The, the objective is not just you know to finish a curriculum or some part of the thing that we wanted to finish. That's, that's always good, but the main focal point is to have an engaging, productive, profitable session to study God's Word. And I think that's also true with sermons. Uh, there are times when we get involved with the lesson and, uh, you know, you look at the clock and it's like five minutes to go and I'm only halfway through the lesson. Where did the time go, you know? And I think that's that's, that says some good things, and yet also we want things to be done decently and in order where, you know, people have certain expectations and uh, different responsibilities after worship and getting ready for the week and all of those things. We try to uh, be mindful of those things as well. And so one of the things that we want to look at this evening is Romans 14, which describes a situation when brothers and sisters differ, when they have different opinions about different things in the Bible and about their, their beliefs, their, their practices. Maybe they, they do things differently and uh, there, there are specific things that they might have ideas about that's sort of speculative or they're not quite sure or there's not enough sufficient information in the Bible to reach a conclusion to everyone's satisfaction and all of those kinds of things which involve some things for brethren to recognize that there are times when we should agree to differ and continue to study those things. And in the process, that may take a long time to come to an agreement. Other situations might be where there's, there's not really an agreement that seems to be visible inside, but that's okay because it's a individual personal matter and not a congregational matter. And we'll look at some of those things tonight, some guiding principles uh, from the New Testament. When we look at the chapter 14, the 14th chapter of the book of Romans, and even the, the conversation that we extend in other pa passages of the New Testament about brothers and, and sisters uh, that disagree, the goal is, is to reach the idea of unity in the church. That doesn't mean that we are agreed in every specific thing, but we're agreeing in what we are doing together. We agree that we want to build one another up and to edify the body of Christ to the fullness of the measure of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So notice what he says here. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down upon those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. I think this uh, translation, the New uh, Living Translation, really gets us thinking about this matter a little bit and focusing. Sometimes we read things in the same version all the time, and we are able to almost memorize them and say the words without thinking. And that has a certain benefit, like we can memorize things. But if we, if we say them or think them without thinking about what they mean, then we're kind of missing the point. And what is valuable about sometimes 
using or consulting a newer translation or a different translation is that you get to re review those things and look them over and consider them. You may still come back to your favorite translation, and that's fine, that's good. But opening your mind to looking at it again in a different way is really helpful. Now, the passage that Rick read in Romans 14, I'd like to just look at that for a moment before we look at some other things. And, and that is that I think the objective and the goal is stated here as we look at uh, verses 17 through 19. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Now, the discussion was eating of certain meats or just eating vegetables. And he says, yes, it, it's really... In his mind, he's going to say that eating anything is okay. Really, that's the bottom line. You can eat that meat or you can eat just vegetables. Either one's fine. But if you think it's wrong, don't do it. That's what he says. And the kingdom of God is not about the decision you make on the food. The kingdom of God is not about the decision you make on the calendar or whether you're going to celebrate one day or not celebrate another day. Like the Jews had all kinds of different celebrations in the Jewish traditions, right? The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Verse 20 says, don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Think about that. Someone believes that eating meat is wrong and in a certain situation where he sees another brother eating, he's thinking, well, I thought it was wrong. Uh, maybe it's not. Maybe it is. I, I guess I'll go ahead and eat it. And then he, his conscience is hurt because he doesn't think it's right. And so he goes ahead and he eats. He's been encouraged to eat something he thinks is wrong. And Paul says, that's, that's ruining that man. You're hurting his conscience. Don't do it. Notice that he's not talking about offending him in what he thinks, but you're offending him in getting him to do something he thinks is wrong. There's a difference. And we'll look at some examples here. You know, I've thought about this thing. I was thinking about this after the morning Bible class, and I think probably all of us preachers here have talked about unity in the church and when bro brothers differ on numerous occasions. And you know, I have sermon outlines and I've got uh, folders and places that I just said, I'm looking at it fresh, you know, I don't want to just go look for some old outline that I did, you know, years ago or something. Let's look at it again and think about it. And so I, I put this together this afternoon. Let me know what you think. So I want us to look at what the situation was in the first century and in this situation in the book of Romans chapter 14, uh, because the brothers were having some disagreements. And in the book of Acts chapter 15, there was some disagreements among the disciples at the church at Antioch. And some brethren from Jerusalem or Judea had gone there to to infiltrate the congregation and, and was saying, well, you know, we hear that some of the Gentiles have become obedient to the gospel. Yeah, that's right. We were able to do that. And this is so, so forth. And he says, oh, that's, that's good. But make sure they're circumcised. Make sure they agree to follow the law of Moses, see. And in other words, they were putting, in other words, they weren't told to do that in order to become Christians. But now these people have come up. They, in fact, they did not have authority from the church at Jerusalem. They just went up on their own accord. But nevertheless, they caused trouble. By the way, that's what a lot of people do. They don't really do it with authority. They go up and they cause trouble. And they do it without any, you know, anybody telling them that's a good thing to do. Of course, nobody would say that. 
it's good to cause division in the church. I mean, Jesus paid his life as a price for the unity of the church and for the establishment of the church. And so turn with me to chapter 15 of the book of Acts. Let's take a look at this situation a little bit as we think about uh, the Gentiles coming into the fold of God's family. Keep in mind that for centuries and even millennia, if you count 2,000 years since the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so you're talking 2,000 years of Jewish tradition being established firmly in the hearts of the people, and they were separated from the Gentiles, and they were thinking that they needed to be separated from those Gentiles, and now there's this thing called the church, and Jesus was resurrected, and now we're baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, and what do we do now with these Gentiles that are supposed to be part of this family of God? So this was part of the issue that was going on. In uh, verse 1 of chapter 15, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. And of course, this is speaking of geography. When it says go up, it doesn't necessarily mean going north. Uh, they were going south here, but the, the topography was that they were ascending into Mount Moriah in the hill of Judea up into Mount Zion, Jerusalem. And so they went up, literally climbed up the steep grade to go all the way up to Jerusalem and to speak with the people in the church there. Peter speaks to them in verse 7. There had been much dispute. Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. So I put on the screen here on this left side, the yellow uh, box, the word us. <laughs> this is Peter, part of the Jewish crowd, right? It's us and it's them. Did you see that? And God made no distinction between us and them. Do you see that? Very clear. Us Jews and those Gentiles. God made no distinction. They were saved just as we are, and they weren't called to be circumcised on that day either. The men, anyway. Purifying their hearts by faith. If you drop down in that chapter, they decided to write a letter and send it to the, the brethren at Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. And uh, it, he says, since in verse 24, since we heard that some went out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. We did not tell them to go up and to tell you that, by the way. So they clarify that this was something that they did without authority, but they were troublemakers. Nevertheless, here's the question is before you. Should you be circumcised as Gentile believers or not? Should you be compelled to keep the law of Moses or not? And so he said, verse 25, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden. Let me just pause here and underscore those words. Think about that. No greater burden than these necessary things. You know, sometimes in the church, people are set out to lay upon other Christians greater burdens upon them than God expects. 
not, not supposed to happen. We're not supposed to lay upon anyone other things than what God says. It's, it's not right to speak without the word of God, and it's not, not right to add things to the word of God that aren't there. Yet sometimes people do that. Here's what you need to do, and I'll summarize it up here. God accepts the Gentiles, and uh, <clears throat> to, it seemed good to lay no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So to put this slide in just a, another different way, think about it this, this way, that the Jews were saying you needed to be circumcised to be saved, and the other message that the Gentiles had been practicing is that, no, we don't have to do that. And so now how do we deal with this question once it arises? And so there was the letter that was sent, and there was a discussion from Peter and James and the early apostles. And by the way, for us today, we don't have any consultation to apostles. If there is a dispute or a question among us, we only have the word of God. We have to go to the word of God and answer those things based on book, chapter, and verse, and what we find in the Bible. Now, we'll look at some things because sometimes the disputes that people have today are precisely about how to interpret certain things in the book, chapter, and verse. And we'll look at some examples about that. But the, the, in the church, you think about one side, us, and the other side, them. Jews, Gentiles. But when they come together in the church, this, this, this green box here, what are they to, they're to abstain from? Foods offered to idols, meat or blood from animals, strangled, sexual immorality. Keep in mind that a lot of these, uh, the, the meat that was eaten in those days was from the bargain store because these had been used previously. Parts, portions of this meat had been used in the cult, in the idol worship. And at Corinth, they had this temple with 1,000 prostitutes, you know, and that's why all of this prohibition against sexual immorality, because it was rampant in that culture. By the way, in our culture today, same thing. It's rampant in our culture for different reasons, but still sexual immorality all over the place. So abstain from that. Keep your hearts pure and bodies pure and all of this. And so that's an example uh, for us to think about there. Now, if we look at any specific question that may come upon us, and we'll look at some principles here. One Christian believes one thing. We'll call it belief X. And then another Christian believes something different. We'll call it belief Y. And they're in the same congregation. Uh, how are they going to get along in this situation? What are some examples? Well, we mentioned two already, smoking. No, we mentioned circumcision, and we mentioned eating meat. Let's talk about smoking for a moment. I mentioned this before. When we were in Kentucky, we had a congregation there where, you know, quite a few people were smoking. <laughs> and it was a little bit interesting when we first arrived. Uh, the, there's usually 10 minutes between the morning Bible class and the sermon. So people went out <laughs> after the morning Bible class, and they were underneath the, the porch there, and there was glass doors. You could see it. It was just like a cloud of smoke out there. I went standing at the pulpit getting my papers ready, and I look out, and it's, it's a bunch of, just a cloud of smoke outside. And it was the smoking situation. And so we talked about that over the six years that we were at that congregation. And, you know, a lot of the folks decided not to do that. But in the meantime, it was not a matter of unacceptance. It was a matter of acceptance, and it was a matter of working together, building one another up, edifying one another, striving to learn and to practice what this thing means called self-control. But nevertheless, in the meantime, we are uh, accepting. We are tolerant. We are believing. Why? Well, because it's not our situation to judge. Who's the judge? God, God will judge. 
To his own master he stands or falls. We will all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ for deeds done in the body, individuals. In the meantime, we work and we strive to have complete knowledge and mastery of God's word. You know, if, if we look here just at the principle here in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17 and follows, that aim for harmony uh, to do those things which build one another up. You know, just thinking about that, that passage, let us pursue the things which we're making for peace and the things by which we may edify one another. Chapter 15, when we who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. The point is edification, right? We were talking this morning in Bible class about this topic of uh, capital punishment. You know, is it, uh, is it okay to, to take a human life if someone has committed murder or crime uh, of murder or serial killing or something? And people that are Christians in the church have different opinions on that. I expressed my opinion based on my reading of Romans 13 that the civil government does not bear the sword in vain. That is, the sword is a very discreet type of instrument for the purpose of killing. And so you behave yourself so that you don't have to face that consequence. But there are other perspectives. We can look at other perspectives and, and, and other arguments. Well, you know, if we keep this person on death row or, or, or put it just life imprisonment instead, then that gives that person more time to read the Bible and to convert. So yeah, I agree. That's, that's a perfectly good argument. How do we treat each other? We accept one another. We pursue those things that are for edification of the whole body of Christ. We aim for harmony to build each other up. And this is just a theoretical belief because the brothers and sisters in a congregation are not really going to be pulling the electricity cord or they're pulling the, you know, doing the noose and any of these kinds of things. I don't know of anyone. And if you don't feel like you should do that, certainly don't take that job. The same would be true for uh, becoming a soldier or a police officer. You know, someone has to do that work. Is it okay to do that? We read about Cornelius, and he was a centurion. You know what a centurion was? He was a general in charge of 100 troops, armed military troops carrying swords. And we, we, we don't read of anything where he changed his career because he became a Christian. But... Nevertheless, some of might say, yeah, he did change his career. We just didn't, did not record it for it. Fine, we're arguing from silence there. But, and, and then, again, it's still a matter of how do we accept one another because this is just a theoretical discussion here. Why are we going to tear down the church for something like that? Why would we even consider that that's a good thing to do? God gave his son to die on the cross. Jesus gave up his life on the cross for Christians to be built together in unity. Why would we look for things to try to tear each other apart? Ought not to be. And so we aim, what do we aim for? What are the goals? What, are the, what is the focal point? We aim for harmony, to build each other up. That's the point. If it, I, I got kind of playing with these slides here, so bear with me, we'll do one more. <laughs> One Christian has belief A, practice B, and a weird idea we'll call C, whatever it is, okay? You can fill in the blank yourself. On the other side, there's another Christian. He's got belief X, practice Y, and weird idea Z. But together, what are they supposed to do? How are we going to treat each other in this situation? What do we have to? What are, what's the core requirements? What do we have to really agree on exactly in, in, uh, th that's the fundamental starting po point? Well, let, let's look at it together for a moment. The plan of salvation is basically uh, a requirement. That's what, what it takes to get into the family of God in the first place. A person must hear the gospel and believe 
that Jesus is the Christ. Confess that he believes in Jesus as the Christ and repent of his or her sins and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. That's immersion in water. And to live a, a, a continuing life of faithfulness. And it's not always an easy thing, but that's what needs to be done. That's the plan of salvation. We must agree on that. The worship, the things that we do together. We sing songs together. We take the Lord's Supper together. We give on the first day of the week. We pray together. We study together. Those are things that we find in Scripture, but we have to agree on that. And if we don't agree on those things, then it obviously affects the fellowship and the worship that we do together. And so there are many people in this world and even the religious world that disagree with us on these things. When I was a Presbyterian, we played organs and pianos and guitars and drums. I mean, we used lots of instruments and I played most of them, I have to tell you. If someone were to propose that today and say, well, you know, let's liven it up a bit, you know, let's get a nice bass going. No, no, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> we don't have authority for that. We, we have to agree on the vocal a cappella singing that we do together. That's fundamental. And if we don't agree on then we cannot work together. Do you, are, am I making sense here? Is that uh, you understand some of the differences here? Let me give you some examples here. What are, what are some of the belief A uh, and the practices B and the weird ideas C and so forth? Well, here's some. I had a conversation years ago with someone who's just, you know, this was Harry Potter was just getting going and, and all this stuff about the, you know, witches and warlocks and, you know, Slytherins and stuff. And uh, they said, I just, I just don't believe in it. What do you mean? You don't believe that the book exists or that people are buying it by the millions? Or No, no, I, I understand that. I just don't think that Christians should read it. Oh, well, that, don't read it. No, no, I don't mean about me. I'm not, I have no intention of reading it, but I don't think you should read it. And, and so there's the rub, right? People have an idea or a thought or the weird idea or, or the hobby. And you find some folks that where whenever they have a chance to maybe lead a Wednesday evening invitation or a sermon or that there it comes again, that same thing all the, all the time. Now, doing that once or twice and just kind of letting people know what you think, is there anything wrong with that? No. Reiterating that so that it becomes divisive and the tearing down of the church that's problematic and cannot be tolerated. That's not something that, in fact, the, there's passages in the scriptures where Paul says, you know what, mark that person that's causing division and avoid them. We'll look at that next week in the book of Romans. But I mean, this is, these are important principles. Here's another one. Uh, when I was uh, first uh, becoming a, a Christian, and I had only been a, a Christian for... Uh, you know, about a year. And then I came down to Florida College to, to get some more Bible. I already had a bachelor's degree. Sandy and I had both graduated and she went to do some work at the uh, University of South Florida in their computer department. And I went to study full time at Florida College. And I, I hadn't any loans in my life until I went to FC and then I had to take loans out. But anyway, that's a, a long story. But all these people, you know, a year or two younger than I were, were talking to me. So, oh, you're a new Christian. You came out of the Presbyterian. Yeah, okay. Well, what do you think about the covering? And I, I says, what, what do you mean? A manhole on the street? What are you talking about? No, no, the girl's covering. I says, I don't have any idea about that. Well, you got to read, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I says, okay. Next class, what do you think? I said, it's very interesting. It's almost like, you know, you got to take my opinion about that. And that's not the case. Brothers and sisters disagree on that. Is it okay? Yes. Someone has a belief, a, in this case, a practice. The ladies would actually, for the men, it's just a belief. For the ladies, it's a practice. Do you practice that or not? I know of, of uh, situations where the, the husband does not think it's important or necessary, but the wife does. So she wears it. 
And he lets her. He says that it's your conscience. You have to do that. There are congregations where uh, some of the ladies wear the covering and others don't, and that's perfectly fine. Now, if it gets to the point where there's division in the church and there's a faction or a group or the ones that believe in it are pushing the other ladies to do it, and if you don't do it, then you're wrong and you're not living the right kind of life, the Bible says here that God has accepted this person. Who are you? Who are you? to judge someone else's servant. He or she will stand or fall before God, and with God's grace, he will make them stand. That's what the text says, and that's how it applies, because people do have differences of opinion. I had another, uh, another example when I was in Kentucky. Uh, we were playing Yahtzee. Uh, this game is sort of like where you, you have five dice that you're doing and so forth. You put it in a little cup and you, you get different uh, full house, flush, three of a kind, whatever. Oh, you don't play that with dice, do you? I says, well, yeah, you want to come? Uh, that's sinful. What? Yeah, you can't play with dice. You, that's sinful. That's gambling. I says, I says here we go again. So I thought about it, and I said, you know what? It's, it's not a dice. It's a hexahedral random number generator. And they said, well, <laughs> it's not worth dividing the church over something like that. And it wasn't. It wasn't at that point, but someone can make things to that point if we, if we let it. Had a conversation uh, before uh, on the translations of the Bible. And this is always interesting to me because, you know, I'm interested in the languages. And uh, he was saying, well, you know, it's King James Version is the only one you can use. I says, well, no, there's plenty more out there. And he, no, no, I know there's others available. You should not use anything other than the King James. It's the authorized version and so forth. And so we, we got into that as well, and I had to try to say, well, you know, that's not the first English translation. There's a whole line of translations that happened before 1611, and then there's a whole line of translations that have happened after 1611. Why are you fixated on 1611 as the translation? The Bible was not written in Elizabethan English first. It was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Koine Greek. But this person knew that. He just said, this is what I think. I says, well, that's fine. But, and, and, and the place where he was preaching, they all had to use the King James. He, he insisted on that, and they weren't going to do anything other than that. And so that's fine if that congregation was to do that. But the issue is that's just a number of things. How many weird ideas can there be? There's, there's a lot of them. But the point is that we need to... Pursue the things for peace. At the end of chapter 14, Paul says, you know, I know and I am convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it to be wrong, then for that person it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. That is like in his presence, right? Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Then you, will, then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and the others will approve of you too. So then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. That's the goal. That's the focus. And that's what I think we should be thinking about. Maybe you're here and you need to respond to the invitation in some way. You need the prayers of the congregation for some sin in your life or some difficulty or challenge that we'll be happy to pray with you about. Or if you haven't been baptized into Christ, we always want to extend an invitation to people that are here in our audience that might wish to do so and therefore be in a saved condition this very day by obeying the gospel. If you're subject to that invitation, won't you come?
while together we stand and sing.